Hi, good morning. So I finally read the first you book and guys, I think Joe might be a bad guy, a creep, a weirdo. I don't know. There's just something about him that doesn't sit quite right with me. No, but for real, after being a fan of the show for the last five years, I've finally experienced the first book and I say experience because I listen to it as an audiobook. I can't read books anymore. My eyes jump around. I get distracted. It's just not a good time. So I'm glad I listened to it as an audiobook because one, it's the only way I would get to experience this story. It was either the audiobook or nothing. Two, I got to react and comment out loud like I do when I watch the show, and that's always fun. And three, the narrator is just amazing. He does such a good job, and it's weird because he sounds enough like Penn Badgley as Joe that, like, from the start, I was like, oh yeah, this is Joe. But he sounds just different enough that I was able to differentiate, like, oh, but this is Book Joe. And that's an important distinction because Book Joe and Shoujo are pretty different in some big ways. And I think it's really interesting to see the things they changed about Joe himself and the story when they adapted the first book into the first season. First, I will say that for me, listening to the audiobook as a fan of the show was probably the best way I could experience the story. Some of the character descriptions are different, but I have a hard time picturing things when they're described. So that didn't even register for me. I just plugged in the characters from the show into the story that I was hearing and it was really easy to like see what was happening in my head as I listened to the book. I think because Joe's narration is such a big part of the show and I've seen it so many times that I'm used to hearing the show without watching it and this was kind of like the same experience. I was hearing the story but I was seeing it in my head as if I was watching the show but I wasn't watching it and I actually didn't realize how vividly I was picturing the story until one day when I was thinking about the cage, you know, how you just think about the cage, and I remembered a scene from the show where Joe is at the bookshop with Mooney when the materials for the cage get delivered, and Mooney teaches him how to set up the cage. But then I remembered that didn't happen in the show, that was just in the book. But as I was listening to the book, I was picturing it so clearly with the characters from the show that I misremembered it as being in the show. So I do wonder how the experience will be when I listen to the other books in the series because I know that seasons two, three, and four didn't follow the books the way that the first season followed the first book. But the first season does have its differences from the book and that's what I want to talk about. So I'm going to get into that. Spoilers, I guess? I mean, if you've seen the show, there's not really much to spoil from the first book. And if you haven't read the first book, you should after you watch this video so that you can keep an eye out for all the differences and see how it changes the story for you. First, we'll talk about characters, who's different, and who doesn't exist. For this section, I'm Spencer Hewitt. That's what it says on my hat, so it must be my name. Ethan is described as being older in the book, like 41, ill, and Joe being the condescending asshole that he is, is always shit-talking him in his narration. He hates Ethan so much. He's hired to work at Mooney's a little ways into the book as opposed to the show where he's younger and he works there from the very start. Beck's friends in the show are Lynn, Annika, and Peach and they're kind of like a little friend group. But in the book, Beck's friends are Lynn and Hannah and also Peach and Peach kind of keeps her distance from the other two. And I think Peach is described pretty different in the book but I don't remember it because it means nothing to me and my brain just says that Shay Mitchell's Peach. There was no Paco, Claudia, or Ron in the book, and we'll come back to that later because the addition of these characters really changes how we see Joe in the show. With no Claudia, that means there's no co-worker Karen Minty, but there is a different version of Karen Minty who does date Joe after he's been ditched by Beth. Also in the book, there's a guy named Curtis that works at the bookstore until Joe fires him, and he later comes back and attacks Joe as opposed to the show where it's Ron that attacks Joe. And finally, Candace. In the book, she's dead. Actually dead. Joe intentionally killed her after she broke up with him and there was no mention of cheating. And relatedly, there was no Elliot the music producer, but it was more like Joe pretended to be working for a music label in order to meet Candace in the first place. Next, I want to talk about plot differences. The very first one is probably the most significant difference between the book and the show, and I think the show suffers massively for it. So in the show, Joe's got a little baseball cap that he puts on when he's stalking people, but in the book, he has costumes. Joe literally buys different outfits to wear while he watches back through her window. Like he gets a tuxedo and a tracksuit and some work clothes. Also, her neighbors don't notice the strange man hanging out on their street day after day. 
And in both the show and the book, Joe follows back to the Dickens Festival. I think in the show he gets like a little hat or something, but in the book, he rents a costume and a beard. Why did the show deprive us of costumes? I demand disguises in season five. So when it comes to Joe's upbringing, we know in the show that he had a rough childhood. His mother didn't have a stable job or any job. And she moves him around but always returns to an abusive boyfriend until Joe shot him and killed him and she had to relinquish custody and Joe was sent to live at a boy's home. He eventually met Mr. Mooney who kind of took him in and taught him about books and gave him a job and was abusive on occasion. But in the book, Joe isn't abused as a child. His mother did leave him and his father when he was in the second grade, but there's no mention of his father being abusive, although Mooney does lock Joe in the cage as we saw referenced in the show. In the show, Joe seems poor, but like TV show poor. In the book, he's like actually poor, but he has 29 typewriters. What he lacks in wealth, he makes up for in an excessive number of typewriters to launch at the wall, creating the hole where he later stores his Beck obsession box. The flip side of this is that Beck is financially fine in the book, while in the show, she's balancing school, a part-time job, being a TA so she can secure student housing, and still has to turn to her parents for money from time to time. When it comes to Beck's friends, it's Lynn and Hannah that shit talk Beck at the open mic, but in the show, it's Peach. So Peach's role in the show is much more antagonistic and manipulative than in the book, but she does still have a crush on Beck in both of them, more openly in the book, I think, but I'm not sure. In the show, she and Beck have a fight, and she later calls Beck after like a fake slash minor overdose, which is meant to manipulate Beck. But in the book, her emergency call comes after she thinks someone has broken into her house a second time, which is totally fair because Joe literally did break into her house. Fast forward to the Dickens Festival. In the book, Joe thinks that Beck saw him, so he ignores her calls as he's returning Mooney's car. And despite knowing that Mooney wants him to come in and keep him company, Book Joe doesn't because Book Joe is heartless. But Beck didn't actually see Joe, and she shows up to his apartment and like confesses to her dad not being dead and all that stuff. And Joe fires Curtis for giving Beck his address because you can't just give somebody your manager's home address. And so then he hires Beck and then later Ethan, who Joe hates so much. Ethan is literally just some guy living his life, and Joe hates him so much and thinks he's so pathetic which is funny because Joe is literally the pathetic one. Like earlier in the book, it was mentioned that Joe had stayed up all night drafting emails to Beck in anticipation of her giving him her email address. That's sad. That's pathetic. So now Beck works at the bookstore. Her and Joe have sex in the cage in the basement like a couple of freaks. And it's so bad that Beck starts blowing off work and heads to Peach's family's house to kind of just let things fizzle out. Very different from the show version where Peach insists that Beck comes with her to recuperate after the attack in the park. So Joe tracks down the address and gets jumped by Curtis and his friends on his way out the door, but he still heads to Peach's anyway, and on his way there, a deer runs into the road and he crashes. So he's been beaten up, he crashed his car, he probably has a concussion, but he still makes it to the neighbor's house and hides in their boathouse until a cop finds him helps him to the hospital, and then gets him to the train station, but Joe's not leaving, so he comes back, and he waits for his chance to strike, and he, like, thinks about how he killed Candace. Instead of abducting and accidentally killing but not killing her after she cheated on him in the show, Book Joe drowned Candace after she broke up with him, which he remembers fondly as he waits to kill Peach. When she passes him on her jog, he attacks her and kills her and fills her pockets with rocks and stages it as a suicide. Similar to the show, but instead of leaving a suicide note typed up on her laptop, Joe sends Beck an email that convinces her that Peach just ran away, so Beck goes home. But she still doesn't reach out to Joe, which is weird because he killed Peach, so she should totally want him now, right? But he starts seeing Dr. Nikki using a fake name, Dan Fox, which is a reference to Paul Fox and Dan Brown, the two authors that they talked about in the first scene. The show references these two authors through Beck's fake name for Dr. Nikki, which is Emma Fox, and Joe's therapy alias, Paul Brown. Joe sees Dr. Nikki for a while, and he meets the original version of Karen Minty, and I could not tell you what her description is. I know it's very different from the character we see in the show, but I do not remember what she was supposed to be like in the book. It's very different, though. I know that. But he hooks up with her, and he worries that he cheated on Beck. Like, guys, she hasn't talked to you in weeks. 
you're fine. So Joe gets a hold of Dr. Nikki's recordings. In the show, they're recordings of sessions, but in the book, they're just kind of like verbal notes that Dr. Nikki is making after sessions. And Joe gets so mad when Dr. Nikki makes the same no bra observation that he did. Hypocrite. But he realizes there's something between Beck and Dr. Nikki, so he breaks up with Karen Minty, and then he plans to kill Dr. Nikki, of course, until Beck calls him right then and he rushes to her, comforting her as she cries over the news of Peach's suicide. She's sad and she drinks and they hook up and Joe stays the night. And the next morning, he starts the day off right by peeing on Beck's shower floor to mark his territory. A totally normal thing to do. Just like in the show, things are good for a while until they aren't so great anymore and Beck is less responsive and pulling away falafel and all. And this must be when she's having the affair. But then she kind of like comes back to it a little bit and things are fine again. Until the day of their quote unquote six month anniversary, which is six months from the day that they met in the bookshop, which is not what a six month anniversary is. Joe has a whole big thing planned, including dinner and sex in the cage, every girl's dream. But uh oh, he comes home to find that Beck has found his Beck box in the wall. In the show, she finds the box because Paco mentioned the loose ceiling tiles in the bathroom, so she gets curious and goes looking. She finds the box with human teeth in it and realizes that Joe is dangerous, but he returns, and so she tries to leave the apartment without raising suspicion, but he realizes what's going on and he stops her. In the book, she's mad and yells at him and then fearful and tries to run from him, but he overpowers her and attacks her and relocates her to the cage. Her time in the cage is pretty different from the book to the show, in the show, she goes through like waves of anger and fear and then calms down and tries to talk to Joe as he navigates a situation with Paco and she ends up writing the story that eventually becomes her book. Then she tries to trick him and convince him that she is in love with him to get him to come into the cage and then she attacks him and runs up the stairs to escape but she can't get out because the door is locked and he comes up from behind her and kills her off screen. Which is a reference to a reference in the book. Book Joe talks about a movie called Closer where the character dies but you don't see it happen. It's just implied and he likes it better that way. I think it's pretty cool how they took that little bit from the book and applied it to how they portrayed Beck's death in the show. As for her time in the cage in the book, first of all, Beck is stuck listening to the title screen of the Pitch Perfect DVD on repeat because Joe didn't actually start the movie. Torture. Then he makes her admit to her affair because he literally has her laptop with her secret second email account that she made because she thought he was reading her emails. Girl, he was. They spend the next couple of days reading a book together separated by the cage until one time Joe comes back to find Beck naked and she seduces him to get him into the cage. They hook up and she doesn't run out of the cage at the very first chance that she gets so he immediately trusts her and leaves all the doors open as he goes upstairs to clean up. But surprise, she escapes the basement and tries to yell for help at the front door. Joe attacks her, gets angry at her, thinks he killed her, feels bad and sad, realizes he didn't actually kill her, gets mad, actually kills her, and then we're right back to sad. He buries her body near Dr. Nikki's property just like in the show so he gets framed for the murder. But Joe keeps Beck's short stories to himself as opposed to the show where he sends the pages that Beck wrote to Blythe to get them published to further incriminate Dr. Nikki. The book ends with Joe getting an invitation to Ethan and Bly's wedding in Austin, Texas, when Amy Adam walks in and remarks that she loves Austin. In the show, Candace is the one to enter the bookshop, and later she meets Forty at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, assuming the fake name Amy Adam. Now I want to talk about the timelines of the book versus the show. In the book, Joe and Beck meet, he later saves her from the subway tracks and she shows up to the bookshop to thank him and he asks her out for a drink. She picks a date but misses it and then reschedules but cancels at the last second to see Benji. Once Benji is trapped in the cage, Joe and Beck do go on a date and then they go to Peach's party and then she asks her his help to get a new bed at Ikea. But he is so mad that the scene does not play out like the scene from 500 Days of Summer. He is so angry that after he leaves Beck's house, after helping her put the bed together, he goes and kills Benji. Beck blows him off for days, and then they make plans, but she cancels at the last second again. That's one missed date and two cancellations so far. Joe and Beck get lunch and then brunch, and eventually he takes her to dinner, but then the date is cut short because Peach calls, so they head over to Peach's, and Beck stays with her for the next two weeks, so Joe barely sees her. It's not until after the Dickens Festival that she shows up to his apartment, and she stays the night and the next day they fool around in a dressing room at the mall. 
Bex starts working at the bookshop, and after a little while, her and Joe hook up in the cage, and it was so bad that she blows off work, she cancels their date, and he doesn't hear from her for 11 days. Guy, just call it. She's not that into you. But no, this is Joe, so he goes out to Peaches, kills her, and another 13 days pass where he does not hear from Bex. He starts seeing Dr. Nikki because Beck had previously mentioned him, and then he meets Karen and dates her for seven weeks until he breaks up with her and plans to kill Dr. Nikki. So we're at like over 10 weeks of Joe not hearing a word from Beck when she finally calls him because she found out that Peach killed herself. She's vulnerable and emotional, so they drink and then they hook up and they're together for like three weeks before Beck says, I love you. And things are good, but then the affair starts, so things start to sour for a while until Dr. Nikki wants to leave his wife for Beck, so she starts avoiding him and throws her energy back into her relationship with Joe, which is coming up on their six-month anniversary. That's when Beck finds the box, Joe traps her in the cage, and the countdown to her eventual death starts. So yeah, in the book, everything happens in the span of six months. Beck cancels on Joe repeatedly, goes weeks without talking to him, only started talking to him again because one of her closest friends died, and then cheats on him anyway. In the show, I think the timeline's a little bit longer, and Beck doesn't cancel on him, but actually shows up to the bookshop multiple times, like she keeps coming to him. After the 8 second sex, she doesn't ghost Joe, she actually gives him another chance and they end up dating for a little while. After Peach's death, they're good for a solid month before the affair starts and Beck breaks up with Joe when she catches him following her. Joe and Karen date for 3 whole months, but he still checks up on Beck's socials every day. 3 months, and this guy will not just move on. But apparently, neither will Beck because she pops up in his neighborhood and then they start texting and then they start cheating and then Joe breaks up with Karen so he and Beck can be together. After Joe calms Beck's suspicions about Candace, she tells him that she loves him, but then the next morning when Joe runs out for a second is when Beck finds the Beck box in the ceiling and she gets freaked out and she tries to leave but he stops her and then traps her in the cage and eventually kills her after she tries to escape. I feel like Bookbeck is not really interested in Joe, but keeps him around the same way that, like, Benji doesn't really want Beck, but he kept her around. In the show, though, she keeps coming back and, like, tries to talk to Joe about what she's thinking and, like, voices how she's feeling as if she wants to make things work. So not only did they change Joe, but they changed Beck quite a bit, too, because she has kind of a different vibe when it comes to how invested she is in this relationship with Joe. Finally, I want to talk about how the changes from the book to the show affect the story. Why did they change Joe's character? Why did they give him a difficult childhood and a little neighbor boy to protect? Why didn't they just bring Book Joe as he is to the show? Because Book Joe sucks. He sucks. He's an asshole. There's nothing to like about him. But with Shoujo, you're presented with like a conflicted guy who just wants to find love and yeah, sometimes he murders people but he feels bad about it and he wants to change. It's not his fault, you know. He had a bad childhood and he was never taught to not be a serial killer. Shoujo seems to feel remorse over his actions while Bookjo is plenty happy to just keep up the good work as the bodies pile up. Personally, I'm not that interested in a guy who has no qualms about killing. Shoujo's reluctance to resort to murder while always having a plan in place should the need for killing arise is just so much more interesting and fun to follow, especially when you have someone like Penn Badgley playing the character. In one scene, he's charismatic and clever, in another, he's on some romantic monologue, and in another, he's losing his cool and pushing a guy off a building. There's more to think about with Shoujo because, yeah, he did have a tough childhood that would reasonably cause some issues and trauma that would stay with him and impact how he navigates the world as an adult, but that doesn't excuse his stalking and manipulating and killing. He does do some good things and kill some bad people, but he's still literally a serial killer. I think it's really interesting for the show to challenge us with a character like Shoujo. With Bookjo, it's clear he's bad. But the show gives us reasons to sympathize with Joe, and they tune us into the conflict that he's experiencing, and they cast someone like Penn Badgley, but then turn around and they're like, but remember, he's a bad guy. And I know some people in the fandom like struggle with that, or they don't struggle with it, because you have to keep two different things in your head at once. Like, this guy experienced abuse as a child and is protecting a neighbor kid from that same violence, and... He just killed a man in front of said child and enlisted his help in getting the supplies to dispose of the body. So Shoujo is better to watch because of that conflict. You want to see him overcome it. 
But Bookjo isn't interested in change. He doesn't feel any deep discord between who he is and who he wants to be. That's just not as fun to watch. So at the end of the day, season to season, you want to see if Shoujo can overcome his nature. Meanwhile, after reading one book, I already want Bookjo to be caught and thrown in jail. I do also think the people who make the show struggle with the fandom's reaction to Joe, because in interviews, they're talking about how you're not supposed to like Joe. And like, they're almost confused as to why people root for him. But it's like, you specifically changed the character to elicit sympathy from us and to give us a reason to root for him. Like in the book, Peach doesn't give a second thought to Joe. He is not on her radar, but in the show, she's like an adversary that's like actively trying to steal back away from him. And when Benji is trapped in the cage in season one, he bargains with Joe and offers up a video that like exposes a death he was involved in. And it's almost like we're given this to like make Benji seem worse so it's easier to accept his murder. But in the book, there is no video. Benji just spends his time in the cage being quizzed by Joe because book Joe is an asshole. The show has Joe kill bad guys, usually to protect the innocent. He killed Ron to protect Paco. He killed Henderson, who was preying on underage girls. He killed Ryan, who was weaponizing the system against Marianne, hurting her and Juliet. Shoujo kills, sure, but he also tries to protect people, so he can't be all bad, right? But Book Joe is all bad. He doesn't have a soft spot for children. He actually, he actually at one point describes this family that he sees in a store and he says that there's a small boy who screams and a small girl who poops in a diaper and drools. Joe, that's just called the baby. What? But there's no doubt in my mind that Joe would punt that baby across her room if it got him any bit closer to sealing the deal with his latest fixation. Sorry love interest. Which brings me to my final thought. Shoujo, at the end of season 4, is the closest to Bookjo that he's ever been. Spoilers for season 4, while I was listening to the book and I was hearing how vulgar and crass Bookjo could be, all I could think about was Reese post-reveal. The way Reese acted in those last few episodes of season 4 felt very similar to what I was hearing from Bookjo. And as we know, Reese was just a manifestation of those certain dark parts of Joe, those nasty thoughts, the violent impulses, the sexual objectification of his love interest. That was all Joe. And by the end of the season, we see that Joe has accepted that part of himself and let go of his little hero complex and the remorse and the guilt over all that he's done. Not only that, but killing Eddie and framing Nadia signaled a massive change in Shoujo as a character. Nadia was like the designated innocent of the season, like Paco or Ellie before her. He helped her out and retrieved the letter that she had sent to Malcolm so she wouldn't be like publicly destroyed if it came out. Funny enough, because he ends the season by framing her for a couple murders, which probably destroyed her image a little bit more than a little love letter would have. By the end of season 4, Shoujo is nearly the same beast as Bookjo, and from what I've seen, a lot of people want him to get caught in the last season. I think part of that comes from it being the final season, and getting caught would have a sense of finality to it, and then part of it comes from it being the fifth season, and it's like he can't keep getting away with this. As I said, Bookjo is a bad guy from the start, and technically so is Shoujo, but it's not as clear and there's conflict there. But now that that conflict is gone and he's realized he's the problem, it's him, but it's not actually a problem. His homicidal tendencies are just a tool to be used. We can see very clearly, yeah, he's the bad guy and he needs to be stopped. I think the book was so good and I highly recommend checking it out, especially the audiobook because I think the narrator really improves the experience of the story. I'm actually listening to another book that he narrates and funny enough, that character is also kind of Joe, but that's a different video. I'm excited to check out the other books in the series because I know they're really different from the show. So that's going to be kind of fun, but like in a different way than this book. But that's all I have for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.